supporting to drink minimum through the Amazon link is the next step in the evolution. Celebrity voice impersonator. From the pages of the World Wrestling Federation magazine, here's update. I don't know about you, but I love this time of year. Maybe it's because I'm from California and the perfect weather allows girls to wear skimpier and skimpier clothes. Maybe it's because the NBA playoffs are on TV, even though my favorite team usually isn't. Or maybe it's because I'm reminded of a unique pay-per-view that really doesn't get the credit it deserves from wrestling fans. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that cheap ECW ripoff. I'm talking about the king of the ring. A pay-per-view that was destined to make stars, or at least advertised to do so. The concept was simple. Over the course of a few weeks, wrestlers would compete in qualifying matches for a spot in the pay-per-view's one-night single elimination tournament. With varying amounts of matches, a wrestler would have to win to be crowned the king or queen of the ring. There were a couple years where the winner got a shot at the champ at SummerSlam, but for the most part, the prize was bragging rights, a crown, a cape, and we're supposed to assume a bonus of some kind. God, I love this concept. But let's get one thing out of the way right now. Uh, I did not classify 2006 in my listing of best and worst King of the Rings. I only, only looked at the proper one night tournaments. So as much as I loved King Booker and the gimmick that preceded it, he doesn't count. All right, so here we go. Let's. We'll take a look now at what was my favorite King of the Ring of all time. The build up to the 94 King of the Ring started out with qualifying matches on WWF programming for the weeks leading up to the pay per view. The matches were, for the most part, competitive to the point where, stealing a page from Doink and Mr. Perfect the year before, Crush and Tatanka had to have multiple matches against each other to determine who would advance. With the exception of Quang vs. Razor Ramon, you really had no idea who was going to win each match, and they all delivered. And when I found out that my hero at the time, Razor Ramon, was going to compete in it again after losing the year before, it warmed the bottom of my heart more than a warm Jack on a cold day. Speaking of Jack... Let's start a drink game! Name on the marquee is to drink minimum, after all. So I designed a drinking game for you when you decide to pop in that old VHS or turn on the network or go to YouTube or however you're going to watch the 1994 King of the Ring and I do suggest you rewatch it. Here's a drinking game to get you fucked up. Now, because the event was in Baltimore, WWF thought it'd be a good idea to bring in former Baltimore cult Art Donovan for commentary. How former? Well, he retired in 1961 and was inducted in the NFL Hall of Fame in 1968, meaning the last time Baltimore as a whole knew his name was at least 26 years earlier. It made zero fucking sense to ask him to do commentary for this event. Unless WWF was banking on his one minute and 19 seconds of fame on a Pete and Pete episode the year before, uh, I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. <laughs> Or, maybe they knew a wise ass on the internet was gonna make a drinking game out of it 20 years later. So here be the rules. Every time Art Donovan asked a wrestler's weight, oh, how much does that guy weigh? You take a sip. Every time Gorilla or Macho Man Randy Savage ignore Art Donovan, you take two sips. Every time Rowdy Roddy Piper says the word man, man, you take a shot. Well, you thought that, you thought that, man. That's a skirt, man. Mm -hmm. And during the Bret Hart Diesel match, you put your drinks down and suspend the game. I'll explain why later. In the meantime, bottoms up. All right, time to discuss the best match of the tournament. And in studying this, I came to the conclusion that there were three best matches in the tournament. Why three? Because I couldn't narrow it down to just one, and because it's my fucking show, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Alright? So, let's go over, in chronological order, the three best matches of the tournament, starting with Razor Ramon versus Bam Bam Bigelow. Razor Ramon versus Bam Bam Bigelow was a textbook match. They were two pros showing why they were pros. Both men 
were pretty much at the prime, if not in a prime of their career. Despite being known as brawlers, they wrestled. They put out wrestling move after wrestling move. The psychology was good. The moves were crisp and clean. It was exactly what it was supposed to be. And it had a great, believable finish. Go back and watch this one. It starts off the night fantastically. The next Bex tournament match was Tatanka versus Owen Hart. Yes, I said Tatanka. Yes, I said it with a straight face. Yes, I'm fucking serious. It's easy to forget over time that Tatanka was fucking over. This match was a great combination of Tatanka being a heavy favorite that could do no wrong and Owen turning into such a brat that you couldn't help but boo him in spite of his obvious talent. I remember as a fan, Tatanka had my sympathy to no end. At that point in his career, he was scout, quote unquote, by Bam Bam Bigelow. He had his undefeated streak ended by a waste of space and money that was known as Ludwig Fuck You Borga of all goddamn people. And because of that, and because of how it went down, he missed out on his first pay-per-view main event. And just when he was supposed to get vengeance on Ludwig Borga at the Royal Rumble, Ludwig Borga went down to an ankle injury, so he couldn't even get that. And he missed out on the biggest event of the year because Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels went over time in a ladder match. And let's not forget the whole raping and pillaging of his land and his peoples. This match was an example of how he was more than just a gimmick. Tatanka could fucking work. But this was Owen's party. And he put another loss on Tatanka's record in the sneakiest way possible. With a legit pin that there's no fucking way out of. The bastard. And the third best match on the card, Owen Hart versus the one, two, three, kid. Again with the psychology, this match was set up by Owen's future partner, Jeff Jarrett, beating the kid half to death after losing to him. The kid tees not being able to come out to the ring, but slowly limps down to the ring to the fans support his music. The, the, the announcers are saying, oh, look at the courageous nature of this kid before smack. Oh, it was the most brutal baseball slide I have ever seen in my life. I swear it knocks some of my teeth loose. It starts at a high level and it never lets up. One of the hardest hitting matches of the night didn't come from the two heavy hitters. It came from two guys who were deemed high flyers. And boy, oh boy, was it fucking brutal. And boy, oh boy, did this show that Owen Hart was for real. The finish, again, was absolutely just right. A Hurricane Rana attempt from the kid turned into a power bomb right into one of the most brutal sharpshooters I have ever seen in my life. Again, Owen Hart was for fucking real. But if you know me and you know my channel, you know we can't just talk all positive. Let's talk about the worst match in the tournament. The worst match in the tournament came to us via IRS and Mabel. And I know you're looking at the name Mabel and thinking, of course it was the worst match in the tournament, but actually it wasn't by that much. See, Mabel was pretty over in 1994. So much so that they put him in the fun-loving giant role and it worked for him. And as a matter of fact, he actually had some pretty good outings, including one with Yokozuna. If you YouTube it, you'll fucking enjoy it. But this match wasn't even all that bad. I mean, Mabel was trying some new things in this match and you could tell that he was really trying to up his game and expand his repertoire, especially when he busted out moves like a small package on IRS that actually looked pretty good until he accidentally legit pinned him. Oops. And speaking of IRS, he did everything he could to get the big guy over. And even Oscar, whose raps usually sounded like your uncle trying to rock rapper's delight while inhaling the fucking microphone, wasn't all that bad. Or as bad as usual. In fact, I did legit like Oscar's new King of the Ring gear. That was a pretty nice touch. But because it was on a show with so many really good matches, this okay match came in last place. But I really wouldn't call it bad, other than the finish. The finish was shit. I mean, come on, Rotunda. You couldn't come up with a better cheap finish than that? Let's talk about the best non-tournament match of the night. With honorable mention going to the Tag Team Championship match, the best non-tournament match of the night was hands down Bret Hart versus Diesel. These guys did amazing work. Diesel was made that night in Baltimore. 
This match was a showcase at how great Brett was in most areas of the game. He worked and made Diesel work, and it shows. Even Art Donovan shuts up for most of this match. That's how good it is. That's part of the reason why I suggest suspending the drinking game for this one. It's a fucking masterpiece. The elements are all there. Champ versus Champ with only the face's belt in peril. That pesky HBK working the outside as if he were the new Cornette or Bobby Heenan. And the return of Jim the Anvil Neidhart. The young gun monster looking to prove himself. And the now established vet looking to submit his place at the top as the guy and make his opponent better at the same time. The back and forth was flawless. The moves crisp and tight, and everybody played their part to a T. There really isn't much more I can say about this match other than if you haven't seen it, see it. I don't give a fuck if you're a wrestler, a manager, an announcer, a referee, a valet, a timekeeper, a fan, a fan of a fan, or a relative of a fan. Watch this match. And the worst non-tournament match of the night was the main event. But Surreal, you just said that the main event was a masterpiece. No, no, I said the heavyweight title match was a masterpiece. Your main event of the evening was Rowdy Roddy Piper versus Jerry the King Law... Um, um, excuse me, folks, I'm sorry. I seem to have confused the 94 King of the Ring script with the 84 King of the Ring script. Can we get the... Wasn't an 84, I'm sorry, 85, the first one, right? I'm, it, what? This is, this is the 94? This is, this was, this was the main event in 1994. All right. The 1993 King of the Ring had an over the L Hulk Hogan on it, but that was in the middle of the show and allowed the younger guys who would still be there to shine after. The build up to this match included a couple of King's Court segments and a couple of promos shot in 1994 era camcorder quality in Piper's dressing room on the set of one of his movies. As a fan, I couldn't have cared fucking less about this match. And as a matter of fact, I didn't even think that WWF really cared about this match because when I got the magazines, that wasn't featured as the main event. The featured main event in everything I had fucking seen was either the title match or the tournament itself. In short, as a fan then, I couldn't have cared less about this match and that statement still holds true today. Now to be fair, Piper looked great, but he hadn't been in the ring for two years and it showed. Lawler, by the time he got to WWF, was over the hill and I've never been a fan of old-fashioned Southern wrestling. And that's pretty much all he could do at this point. Listen, 1994 WWF, I get that you wanted to do something with Jerry the King Lawler on a pay-per-view titled King of the Ring, but A, it's not that important that you do, especially since you're going to shove him down our throats for years to come. And two, if you insist on doing something like that, stick it in the middle of the show. I don't get it. Was it the main event because Roddy Roddy Piper was coming back? Most fans that they were targeting at that point either barely recognized him or had no idea who he was in the first place. I wouldn't say that he had the same drawing power that he had when he left. Even if they did, they weren't promoting that match as the main event. They were going back and forth between Bret Hart and Diesel and the tournament itself. So why stick this one at the end of the show? I had zero reason to care about this match before and even less after it started. These guys looked their age, 44 and 40 respectively, and so did not fit on the card. This could have slash should have been the main event of a charity indie show or a special Raw or something. Not a pay-per-view that WWF was trying to establish as one of their big five. I mean, what more do you want me to say about this pay-per-view? Near perfect card, near perfect matches, sets the company up for the next year. This is your ideal King of the Ring. Which is why I find it so hard to believe that not too long after this, they would fuck up so, well, royally. Folks, tell me what you think down there in the comments section. Like, share, subscribe. If you like this, share with your friends. Let them know. Hit those links in the description. Help keep the lights on at the party and party people that unlike the soon-to-be worst King of the Ring of all time, ain't bad. Boom. Boom. And the most regal. Boom.